morning, Tacoma Park Church. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for joining us in worship today in person. And thank you those joining us online. We welcome you to today's service. When I was learning how to read Hebrew in seminary, we learned the greeting Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Literally translated, peace on the Sabbath. And isn't that what we need in our lives? Isn't that what we need right now? Peace. Peace from all the stress. Peace from all the drama. Peace from all of the things that are going to be calling us after the Sabbath. So I want to try something with you right now here in person and those watching online. I want you to repeat after me. Shabbat Shalom. Let's put it all together. Shabbat Shalom. And peace be unto you as well. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Tacoma Park. We invite you to stand with us as we sing our opening song, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. forget me forever how long will you hide your face from me how long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart how long will my enemy triumph over me look on me and answer Lord my God give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death and my enemy will say I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall but I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this breath of life that you've given us today. Today, we offer ourselves, our hearts, as a sanctuary where your spirit can dwell. As we worship here today, 
Calm our hearts from our anxieties. Allow us to release our burdens at the foot of the cross. Relieve us from our fears, Lord, and give us the peace that we so desire. A lot of us may be wrestling with anxiety, with depression, Lord. You reign above all things. So we pray right now to receive your Holy Spirit, not just today, but every day, and as we worship your name. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, Day by Day. in the posture for prayer.
Dear Lord, thank you so much for your Sabbath day. Thank you that we can come here together to worship you, to rest from our work of the week, to rejoice in your rest, to enjoy one another's company, and to worship you, because you are so worthy to be praised, Lord. We thank you for all that you've done for us, the many blessings that you've given us, individually, as a church, as a family. We thank you for all of your gifts. But we also thank you that you have invited us to cast our cares on you, because you know that we all have cares, burdens, things that are troubling us. For many of us, those burdens are physical. They might be financial needs that we have, the need for a job, the need to pay the next bill. They might be health challenges. We pray especially for one of our church family, Carmen Moore, who is in hospital right now. We bring her to you because she needs your healing. We ask you to guide the doctors, to give her the right medical advice, to find what is uh, her health issue, Lord, and to heal her, Lord. We just bring her and put her into your hands because we know that you care for her. You know what's going on, and you have, a, you have the power to heal, Lord. We just ask you to heal Carmen, and we pray also for others in our church, Lord, who are facing health challenges. For many of us, the burdens that we carry are emotional, stress at work, concerns about our jobs, anxiety about our families, fear for what is happening in our communities, in our country, in our world, personal traumas that weigh us down. You know about our cares and you have promised to be with us through all of our challenges and difficulties in life. We know that because we know that you know these challenges because you experience them yourself. When we grieve, we know that you have grieved too. When we cry, we know that you cried too. When we feel physical or emotional pain, we know that you experienced it too. So through it all, Lord, I pray that you, we hold fast to the promise that you will be with us always, even to the end of the world through everything, and we hold true, we hold tight to the promise that there is comfort in your presence. So as we are gathered here in church now, on this Sabbath day, just like some 2,000 years ago, you were in the synagogue and unrolled the scrolls, we ask you today to proclaim good news to the poor. We ask you to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, we ask you to set the oppressed free. We ask you to proclaim the year of your favor. In your holy name I pray, amen. Pastor, that is a rhema word for me this morning. The hymnist says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. And oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I don't know how many warriors we have in here. Not warriors, but warriors. And I will be the first to say that I worry too much that God won't show up. Worry too much that God won't come through that God won't keep his promise. And that's no way for us to live, not as a believer. And so I wanna sing a song to you this morning um, that will challenge you, hopefully encourage you, and also hopefully empower you to trust what God says to be true. my mind, sir. 
searching for that peace, but peace I could not find. Then I kneel down to pray, praying, help please. Then he said, you don't have to cry, cause I'll supply your Soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story is, and then I let go, I let go and, I and I let God, God let, let Him have His way, way, and that's when things, that's when things start, start happening. happening. I stop looking at back then. then. I let go, I and let I go, and I let God. Sometimes I can't find my way And oftentimes I struggle Struggle from day to day But I had to realize that it's not my battle It's not my battle to fight I had to know if I put it in his hands Everything would be alright I stopped worrying, worrying how, the story how my story's gonna end. I let go, I let go and I let God, I let Him have His way, and that's when things start happening. When I stop looking at back then, when I let go and I let God. Let him have his way, so let go and let God, let go and let God, let go, let God, oh let go and let God, let go, let God, my brother let go and let God, he can handle it all. So just let God, so let go, and let God, let go, and let God, just let go, and let God, He knows what you're going through, let go, He knows what you're dealing with, so let God, sometimes there's tears in your eyes, but let go, sometimes there's hurt, in your heart, but let go, cause he knows your issues, and he knows your struggles, so turn it over to Jesus, and let go, as soon as, soon as I stop worrying, how my story's gonna end, that's when things start turning around, for his good, and for his glory. Sabbath was the first time we reintroduced this, so I'm inviting all of my young friends to join me here to enjoy today's story, children's story. Please come and join me. I feel kind of lonely up here on my own. Thank you. My, I could see my friend Gabriel back there, 
and Elijah and Alicia and Christopher and I can't see others just join me up front here please children's story as they come what I'm holding in my hand it's like a soft little ball but the unusual thing about this it has it's like a little globe it's like a little globe and I'll be showing it to the students um, pre-COVID I could just give the ball and they'll pass it around and they'll give it back to me but I don't want to face any mothers that would ask me like do you have any wipes for those children anyway so I'm gonna hold on to it thank you for joining me up front here hi guys happy Sabbath morning to you my story is entitled the little boy who disobeyed his grandmother it wasn't very wise the little boy who disobeyed his grandmother now this ball has got different colors on it as you could see different colors all right I'm gonna ask you what is the thank you girls Isla and Farah, thank you for joining me. What is the most popular, or what, what color do you see the most on this ball? What color? Please tell me. Yes? The blue. The blue. Is, agreed? And the blue is, is, is what in the real world? Yes, Elijah. Ocean or seas and stuff like that. There are some people who love being by the water. They just love, like some, sometimes if they have the chance, they'll build their house near the, um, you know, if I say the seaside, does some of you know what I'm talking about? The beach, the beach. They love their, or, or like if there's a nice river and they could see the river moving. This little boy, he just loved being near the water. His grandmother, and this story takes place in South America, his grandmother loved fishing. She could fish with a fishing rod, she could fish with a fishing net, and sometimes it's hard to describe, but she could even use a string and things like that. And sometimes if there were lots of fishes, she could like throw some rice into the water, and as the fishes come, she'll get a net and just scoop it up. But this boy, he, thought he could swim. He thought it was easy because other children did it all the time, but his grandmother said, you're not allowed to do that. One day, one day, when his grandmother went out, he thought, this is my chance. I'm gonna go for a swim. So he went out through the back door, through the back fence, and down into the water. Now, near the beach, sometimes we see the sand, we could go in, it's on our toes, it comes off easily. That even though it was muddy, that didn't worry him. He just kept on going, he just kept on going. And slowly, because it's the first time, and he's, he's a little bit timid, but he's just happy that he could do this. But as he kept on going a little bit further and further, there's a current, a current was, was, was like, grabbing hold of him. Do any of you know what I mean by the current? Elijah, go. A big wave? Almost like a big wave. As sometimes when you look at a river, it's usually flowing in a certain direction. And that flow, even though it looks so gentle, if you were in it, it's going to take you in the direction of the flow. And this little boy, unbeknownst to him, he's just there enjoying himself. He's like waist deep, then chest deep, then shoulder deep, and it's like, um, yeah, I think that's far enough. And he tried to do a few strokes, like what the other children, you saw the other children do, and he couldn't. He, he tried to lift up his feet, do a little bit of kicking, and as he did that, the water started drifting him away. And of course, he began to panic, he began to worry because now water was going into his nose and into his mouth and, his <coughs> and stuff like that. He was really scared. The thing I didn't tell you, this little boy should have known to obey his grandmother because this little boy used to go to Sabbath school. This little boy was taught about his guardian angel. 
at that moment in time, he remembered to pray. And he started to pray. He started to pray in his heart because if he opened his mouth, he would, some of that dirty water would go down there and he prayed. And it's like this idea came to him to hold his nose, go down and try to kick for the shore that he still could see because the water is now going and he's kind of drifting along. It was a frightening experience. And, and, and he's doing that. Then slowly he's praying and he's trying to kick and he's holding and holding. And as he's doing it some more, he's trying. Then he felt like his feet again is touching the ground. And then to try it again. Yes, his feet is touching it more. And he started walking out. The little boy who disobeyed his grandmother almost drowned that day. Almost died. I know this little boy very, very well. Because this little boy is standing in front of you. Brother Saul, Shem Saul, Papa Saul. You know, I don't even have any gray hair to show you how old I am. But he remembered and he was so thankful that he was taught to pray. He was so thankful that he had a guardian angel. But then he realized that he disobeyed. But the Lord Jesus, he tells us that even when we have done wrong, we should come to him, ask for forgiveness, and try to do right. There isn't a day when I wake up in the morning, sometimes I have some aches and pains, that when I wake up in the morning, I am not thankful that the Lord spared my life. So I just wanted to share that story with you, that you should be obedient children, obedient students, because the Lord told us in the Bible, if we do wrong, bad things are going to happen. In Exodus chapter 20, hard question, Exodus chapter 20, do you know what, what instructions are in Exodus chapter 20? Gabriel, any idea? Trust and obey, yes, a little bit more. It's known as the 10 something, 10, 10. Commandment. Right, you found right there. And I used to think, it said, thou shalt not do this, you should not do this. But nowadays I see it differently. It's like, if you want to be happy, you will not steal. You will not tell lies. You will not hurt other people, and so on and so forth, because it's rules for happiness. And thank you for listening. Please return to your seats and remember to obey your parents, your grandparents, and your loved ones. In Jesus' name. Amen. happy whenever we get to do something a little bit special on Sabbath and today we have something that we're going to be doing we have several people that we're going to be ordaining as deacon and deaconess today and so I want to just invite up Noah Kakinda, Muriel Felix, Lola Ferguson, Irene Zimulinda, I hope I said that right, Simone Enkel, Trisha Henry and Velma Hibbert and as they come, I wonder if we could give them a hand. Can we do that? Okay, all come right here so we can all see you. And we can uh, witness who you are. You go, okay, you can stay right there. And um, let me just say, first of all, come on in, Noah, this way. Yeah, in fact, let's put Noah right in the middle so it's, uh, you know, so you, yeah, it's even. Stand right here. There you, now, now you're in the middle, Noah, on this side. There you go. Three on the left, three on the right. Um, I want to say, first of all, that there are several um, offices that you can hold at church. But uh, deacon and deaconess is slightly different, in my opinion. And maybe you agree. 
Uh, the biblical word, the Greek word for deacon is diakonos. And there is something that I believe is in the heart of a true diakonos that's different from other offices in the church, and that's one thing. A deacon or deaconess isn't noticed as much as some of the other people in their offices. You don't necessarily see them up front a lot. They do a lot of behind-the-scenes things. In fact, I would say that deacon and deaconess fall into a category of people, uh, sort of like the AV team, where you don't even notice that they're there unless something isn't happening. Something goes wrong. Then you say, oh my goodness, where's the deacon? Where's the deaconess? So it takes a certain kind of personality style and a certain kind of temperament to do this well because you know that you're not necessarily in it for the glory. You know, pastors get up and they get to talk in front of everybody every Sabbath. So some of us in the profession of pastor are in it for the attention. It's about being able to talk to everybody and everybody listen at the same time. But if you're a deacon or deaconess, you're not going to get opportunities like that. So it takes a different kind mental and a different kind of spiritual aspect. And so I think that deacons and deaconess are extremely valuable, but I think you're even more valuable than we realize because so much that you do goes unnoticed. So I want to start, which is why I asked everybody to clap for you, I want to start by recognizing all that you do that we don't necessarily notice. And can we give them a hand one more time? <laughs> So I know you're not in it for the acclaim. I know you're not in it for the congratulations. But we do want to say that we appreciate you, that we love you, and we believe that God is using you. And we believe that there are aspects of church life that would not be possible without you. So thank you. When the disciples were on the earth and they were trying to get things going, they noticed that as the church began to grow, they were spending a lot more of their time doing things other than prayer and study of the word. And so they wanted to give themselves over to that. So they came with an idea of, let's get some deacons, some diakonos, to help out with some of the things that go on in church life. And the Bible says that once these seven men were chosen, that the church grew. And I believe the Bible is saying that there was a connection between the fact that there was someone to handle a different part of the church work so that the disciples could give themselves over to prayer and study of the word. So there's a direct link between diakonos and church growth. So we need you, and we thank you for what you have done. And so today, all we want to do is recognize what the Holy Spirit has already said. When we do an ordination, what we're doing really is we're saying, we agree with you, God. These are people that you have set aside We've already seen how you are using them, and now all we want to do is pray a special prayer of consecration over them so that you can use them at another level. And that's what we're hoping God is going to do today. And so I'm going to ask the other deacons if they would come. I think there are a couple here. I know our head deacon is here. Okay. Why don't you come? Any other deacon that's in the present, please come. Deaconess, please, if you are here, I'd love you to come as well. If you're an ordained deacon already, or ordained deaconess, just come to the front. I want to ask these deacons and deaconess to kneel down, and I want us to kneel around them as we pray. So come on up. Come all the way up. And if you don't mind, I'll help you down and help you back up. Do you mind kneeling? If, if you can't, then it's okay. <laughs> yes, you, we'll help you get back up. <laughs> Come right around, deacons and deaconess, if you would. Yes, no problem. Come right around and stand close to them, would you? And put your hands on them, if you can. If you can stand close to one of these deacons or deaconess, put your hands right on them. And if you can't get close enough to put your hand on them, put your hand on somebody else that is touching them. And then, church family, I wonder, would you rest, would you reach out your hands toward them as we pray this special prayer over them right now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for the deacons and deaconess who are kneeling right here. God, they have dedicated their lives to the service of your work, and Lord, we are thankful for the heart that you have given to them. Thank you for blessing us with them, 
And now, Lord, all we're doing is we're agreeing with the Holy Spirit who has already set them aside, who has already set them apart, who has said, this is my son, this is my daughter, who I am using for my glory. Lord, I ask that you would do something special in them right now. Would you, God, set them apart for a holy use? Would you elevate them even though we know right now that what they do most of the time is below what many of us would want to do? But God, we are servants just like you. You took a robe, a towel, and you put it around your waist, and you uh, knelt down, and you, you, you actually washed the disciples' feet. That was beneath you. And yet you showed us, as the God of the universe, that you yourself are a servant. So I thank you, God, for these seven servants who are kneeling here today. And I'm asking that you would use them for your glory, that you would seal them today, that you would do a mighty work through them, that we would actually be able to add numbers to the family of God because of their efforts and because of the things that they do on a daily basis. Lord, may they be an example to others around them of what true service is like. May they not worry about being above. May they not worry about being exalted, but instead give them a heart to serve not because people deserve it, but because we don't deserve it and you did it for us. Freely we have received, so we will freely give. Sanctify each one. Bless each one today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm helping you now, like I said. <laughs> I promised you. <laughs> it's okay. We'll take, we'll take our time. <laughs> yes. You want to hold this rail right here? Oh, we'll do this one. Okay. Like that. Yes. So we have some certificates that we have made available to them so that they will remember this day and that they'll be able to say that they were ordained on, I believe today is October the 8th. Is that the right day? Sabbath, October the 8th was the day that they were ordained. And we're excited about that. We believe that God's going to continue to bless them and use them for his glory in all things. Let's give them another hand, everybody. Can we do that? Your certificates are right here. Yes. You know, all of my life, I've been told and I've heard that Jesus is soon to come. And I would venture to say that most of us in here have heard the same thing. Jesus is soon to come. And throughout the different stages of life, I notice that my passion, that my zeal, that my commitment even sometimes was starting to wane and turned into what I would call apathy. And I had to ask myself, several years ago, I had to ask myself some very simple questions, but still very poignant questions. And I wrote this song um, titled The Questions. I wrote it to myself. And I want to ask you those same questions today. Because when we look at our world around us, are we truly ready? Do we truly want to see him? Do you 
Dewan for that song. Can we give another hand, everybody? Absolutely beautiful. We are in our second week of our revival. This is the uh, second official sermon. We started last week. And we are excited about what the Lord is doing in our church and hopefully with others who are able to join us from week to week online to change the negative stigma around mental health. That's what we're trying to do this entire month of October. And we believe that God has already begun to bless us in this completely whole revival. On Wednesday night, if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and watch it online. You can go to our YouTube channel. I believe it's in our Facebook uh, as well, but it's probably easier to find on YouTube. Uh, there you will see Dr. Maya Thomas. She pours into our lives about issues related to stress and burnout, and we had quite a good time. In fact, I think it would have been nice if we had more time with her because it was that good. Uh, we did our quiz on Wednesday night as well, and as you know, we have uh, prizes that we like to give out, and the prizes we like to do, we like to give them sort of related to what we're dealing with, and so the big grand prize that's going to happen at the end for the person that has the best cumulative quiz score is a 90-minute massage at Massage Envy. We've been talking about stress and burnout and all that stuff, and some of you haven't had a massage in a long time, maybe you've never had one in your life. It's a good opportunity for you to get one, to get some relaxation. Uh, but all you have to do is come. You've got to be here on Sabbath and maybe take notes because every time we have a quiz on Wednesday, it's always based on the Sabbath sermon. And then whoever has the best cumulative quiz score, uh, we'll choose from that and uh, make it happen. And so uh, we're excited about what the Lord is doing for us and through us. And um, wow, sorry. Every so often I get uh, text messages in the middle of my message, and I don't always check them. Uh, but I just checked this one. Sister Grace Henry texted me to say that good news, Carmen just woke up. Carmen is the young lady we were praying for earlier in the service. And uh, this is Lennox Henry's niece that is in the hospital, Carmen. And uh, we just praise the Lord for that wonderful news. Isn't it great to get real time? <laughs> we pray to the Lord and he does things immediately. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for that text message. Uh, to brighten us up during a time like this. I know it's difficult right now to see your loved one in that situation, and there are many others like that, but we can get encouragement and grace as we know that God is still working. So, I wonder if you fasted this week. We had a fast. It was not a food-related fast. We might do one, but that wasn't this week. This week we fasted from busyness. Did anybody fast from business this week? Did you at least try? Okay, good. There were some participants. Wonderful. <laughs> put your hand up in the chat. You know, put a little hand emoji up in the chat if you're online and you joined us this week. I, I wonder, was it helpful? Did it do anything for you? Did, did it make you uh, a little bit less frantic? Were, were you maybe less stressed out? Did you spend more time with your family members this week because you weren't going at a frenetic pace all the time? Now, I stayed active my calendar still had a lot of things in it, but with each thing that I did, I tried to create a buffer between this activity and the next so that I wasn't just ripping and running. You know how I normally schedule stuff? Like literally, I schedule things so that if I have to go from one place to the other, that it literally will be, as soon as this is done, it has to end exactly on time in order for me to get in the car and get to my next one so I can start that one on time. And if one thing gets behind, I'm rushing even more the rest of the day. Why do I do that? <laughs> Well, this week I didn't do it. I, I did a lot better, and I felt better because of it. I hope you did, too. I hope you did, too. Well, this week we are going to have another fast, and I always announce them right before the sermon. I'm going to do it now. And this is a fast that we've actually done more times than any other fast since I've been the pastor here at Tacoma Park Church. I got here in 2018. It's been about four and a half years, and we've had several revivals in that time, and we always do fasts, and this fast is our family's favorite fast. And it just so happens that this fast goes with today's subject, and that's why we're deciding to do it. We're fasting this week from negativity. Yes, yeah, so you know that one. And you grumble and grime every time I say it. <laughs> it's the hardest fast of them all, isn't it? It's so easy to be negative. 
But this week, we are not going to be negative. It's a negativity fast. So this week, we're not going to grumble or gripe or complain. We're not going to gossip. We're not going to talk about all the things that are going wrong. Instead, we're going to focus on the good things. We're going to find at least one thing every day. There's at least one thing that happens in your day every day that is positive. In fact, there's more than one, but there's at least one. And sometimes it just takes us changing our perspective to find it. And so this week, that's what we're going to do. And I believe that God's going to bless us. So the negativity fast begins tomorrow. You continue with your busyness fast through the rest of today. And then tomorrow morning when you wake up, that's when the negativity fast begins. I hope you're going to join me. Raise your hand if you're going to join me. Okay, good. Got a lot more participation this time. Wonderful. (laughs) Now let me say this to you. Here's what happens. The moment you stop focusing so much on the negative you begin to really realize just how blessed you are. And let me tell you, you were already that blessed before. You just didn't notice it because we spend so much of our time. Now, let me say this too. There's so much negative going on around us all the time. So it's not like it's hard to be negative. Almost everything in life is negative. You get in your car, doesn't start, or it does start, and the heat doesn't work. was my situation last week. It's getting colder now, so I'm complaining about that. I'm driving on the road, and it's a little bit slippery, and my tires are old, so I'm slipping around a little bit. I'm complaining about that. I get to the highway. There's an accident because there's a little particip- uh, precip- precip- precipitation. You know, you know that here in Maryland, if there's a little bit of wetness on the ground. There's going to be several accidents on your way. So I haven't even gotten to my destination yet. I haven't been awake for more than three hours, and I'm already complaining already. Not this week, though. Not this week. We're going to focus on positive things. Think about the things that God is blessing us with. Find at least one blessing of the Lord every single day. You'll be able to find more than that. And I believe your days are going to be better this week because of it. Who says amen to that? Good. Glad we're participating. Okay, now let's recap last Sabbath. Just in case you missed last Sabbath's sermon, I want to recap it real quick. We entitled it Running on Empty. And we took a look at the prophet Elijah. And we found out some interesting things about stress and emotional burnout as we looked at his story. We used the passage in 1 Kings 19 as our guide, and we observed the prophet of God in an unusual posture. He was in a state of hyper-stress over the bounty that was put on his head by Queen Jezebel. In other words, she wanted him dead, (laughs) and he was running scared. And instead of chastising him, or thinking he's weak, or talking down to him, the Bible simply reveals Elijah's true condition with no negative words about it at all. So that we can find encouragement and strength and comfort in his plight. Not because he was going through it, but because we've seen ourselves in that situation too, haven't we? And if God is not coming down on the prophet of God, then maybe he understands us as well. Who says amen to that today? The prophet of God's a human being, and he too can succumb to stress and burnout. He was so stressed, in fact, that he asked God to take his life, and he was serious. And we love the fact that God doesn't hide this reality from us. He does not try to create a larger-than-life, super-spiritual giant for us to strive to be like. Instead, God shows us exactly who he is in his human frailty and his weakness, so that we can be drawn to God instead of to Elijah. (laughs) And we ended the sermon last Sabbath with three possible reasons why we allow stress and hyper-stress to play such a pivotal role in our lives, even though we know it's negative. Here's what we said. Number one, we don't think we have another option. Many of us have bought into the lie that the only way to live is to continue running on empty always drained and depleted as we run on this hamster wheel of life at the constant frenetic pace and always tired. But the reality is that if we pause our work, the world will keep on spinning. Who says amen to that today? (laughs) So we need to do better with resting in the work that Jesus has already done. The second thing we said was we have competing values. Another reason why we allow stress and hyper-stress to kind of take over because we have competing values. We tolerate things that cause us distress because in many cases, 
those same things give our lives meaning. Many of us don't know who we are without our work, and we fear that putting it all aside will mean losing a piece of ourselves. We want to be peaceful. We want to have stress-free lives, but we have a competing value of wanting to feel useful and build our legacy. So we make room for the distress in order to retain our self-worth. But we need to find our ultimate worth in Jesus, not in the things that we do. Who says amen to that today? He's already done enough, so we can't add to it anyway. Number three, we don't know our limits. Many of us never stop to take a break because we don't realize that we need to. We think that we're indestructible and invincible, especially as we're younger. We stop feeling that as much as we get a little older, but we still push ourselves way too hard. <laughs> we think we're indestructible, never allowing ample time for our physical bodies to recover. Not being able to recognize our limits will eventually invite sickness and disease into our lives. And we ended the message with a positive word for counseling and therapy. It is a good thing. In fact, for some of us, it has been a game changer, like in the life of your pastor. That was last Sabbath's sermon. Today, I want us to consider another prophet who was basically tormented internally as we consider the subject of depression. We're going to peer behind the curtain of Jeremiah's life in this message entitled, Depressed but Not Defeated. Let's pray. Father, we need your encouragement at this very moment. As we talk about this subject that we don't talk about much from this desk, I ask that you would give us open hearts and minds. Lord, there's a reason why the devil is happy that we don't talk about such things. It's so that the people of God can remain in darkness. It's also so that the only voice that the people of God listen to on this subject is in the world, and maybe we'll be misguided. But Lord, we want you to show us from your word how we can deal with such things. That way, we can be in alignment with what you want us to be. Do that for us today, please. Send your Holy Spirit. May he be our teacher. May we leave changed, never to be the same again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Depressed but not defeated. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 20. What book did I say? Jeremiah 20, starting in verse 14, reading to verse 18. And just in case you're falling asleep, I want to ask you to stand. We'll make this our scripture reading. We'll start in verse 14, read to verse 18. We'll do it from the screen together. This is the English standard version of the Bible. So get a little blood flowing and, you know, then I can preach a little bit longer and you won't fall asleep as fast. I won't preach as long. I'm just kidding. Okay, let's read. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me in the womb, so my mother would have been my grave, and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame? I'm going to ask you to say amen to the Word of God, even though it's a tough one. Who says amen to God's Word today? You may be seated in the house of the Lord, depressed but not defeated. Let's be honest, that was a grim and morbid perspective from the man of God. It was. And let's be even more honest, we are quite uncomfortable with it. Hearing that from a prophet and then reading it at church, he made us stand up and everything. When we read the text, we're tempted to dismiss it 
as a metaphor, some kind of figure of speech. Maybe he's being poetic and he doesn't really mean what he's saying. He's being extra dramatic on purpose to bring some point out. Surely Jeremiah isn't speaking literally about God taking his life. On the contrary, this is quite on brand for Jeremiah. The prophet is well known for his weeping. His nickname among theologian is the weeping prophet. There's a reason for that. God set Jeremiah aside to announce judgment to a people who refused to listen to him. So from the beginning, it's like he would never have any job satisfaction. Imagine if God called you to do something and said, listen, you're going to fail every time you try it, but I need you to be my mouthpiece. <laughs> Jeremiah was in an impossible situation. He saw the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and his people led into exile. No wonder he was in despair. It's like they're just taking L after L. Throughout his writings, Jeremiah displays signs of dramatic, uh, excuse me, signs of, of depression. And according to Merriam-Webster, here's what depression means. A mood disorder that is marked by varying degrees of sadness, despair, and loneliness, and that is typically accompanied by inactivity, guilt, loss of concentration, social withdrawal, sleep disturbances, and sometimes suicidal tendencies. Now, I think you would agree that the prophet Jeremiah is displaying several of these tendencies that we just read in the definition in this passage that we just read from. But wait a second. You're telling me the man of God is depressed? Yes, I believe we see signs of depression and that many other mental health challenges throughout Scripture we can see and find if we look close enough at these different Bible characters. That's why we're doing this this month, because we are hoping that we shed some light on the idea that even though we haven't been talking about it for a long time, doesn't mean that God doesn't know about it. God knows more about it than we realize. In fact, it's all in His Word, and if it would just take a little bit of time to notice it, we'd be more encouraged when we find ourselves in the same predicament. God has not forgotten us. He put it in his word so that we ourselves could be encouraged in times like these. Who says amen to the word of God today? I believe that these things are in scripture. We can see them in the various Bible characters. And this should be encouraging because it means that God is not scared off by knowing that we deal with these issues. We might be scared to talk about it, but God's not scared. <laughs> and he can do something about it. Who says amen to that today? So this week, I read a study, a study by Boston University's School of Public Health, and they're reporting uh, some specific things. I got a piece of it on the screen for you. Depression among adults in the United States tripled. It did what, everybody? Tripled in the early 2020 months of the global coronavirus pandemic, jumping from 8.5% before the pandemic to a staggering 27.8%. But worse still, the elevated rate of depression persisted into 2021 and even worsened, climbing to 32.8%, affecting one in every three American adults. Those numbers are staggering. But research found another interesting fact, and I quote, the sustained high prevalence of depression does not follow the same patterns we observed after previous traumatic events, such as Hurricane Ike and the West African Ebola outbreak, says study senior author Sandra Gallio, dean of the Boston University School of Public Health, and Robert A. Knox professor. He continues, typically, we would expect depression to peak following the traumatic event, and then lower over time. Instead, he says, we found that 12 months into the pandemic, levels of depression remained high. 
So if one in three Americans were dealing with depression during the height of the pandemic and it kept going for like a year and didn't go down at all, it like plateaued and stayed flat the entire time, there's a high likelihood, a high probability that someone in the house of God today or someone watching online is dealing with depression right now. The likelihood is high. So we need to have a forum for talking about this kind of thing in church because it's affecting a bunch of our people. But because we've often had an aversion to discussing such things, our members are struggling through these issues alone. I'm here to tell you, you are not alone. And I don't just mean that God is with you. I mean there's probably somebody in your pew dealing with the same thing right now. We just don't have the ability in church to talk freely about it. Not without shame. But you are not alone. Who says amen to that today? Aren't you glad to know you're not the only person going through something? <laughs> it may feel like you're the only one, but you're not. Furthermore, we give off the impression that going through any of these mental health challenges makes you weak or low in faith. We do that, don't we? But I'm here to tell you today that God sees you in your despair and he knows you by name. He's fully aware of your situation and he has not forgotten about you. In fact, the psalmist says this, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are in the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Psalm 34 verses 18 and 19. Who says amen to God's word today? Your situation might feel like it's crushing the wind out of you. You, you ever got hit in the stomach? You ever, you ever had anybody take the wind out of you? It, it's like you can't breathe. You, you've had that happen before. It's a terrible feeling. That's probably what you feel like right now in your despair. But God wants to make you completely whole in him. <laughs> and by the way, we talked about this last week already. God uses methods more than prayer to help to make you completely whole. Uh oh. I'm not diminishing prayer. I'm elevating. This is what we did on Wednesday night. I'm, this is what Dr. Maya Thomas helped us to do. She said that there are spiritual gifts that God has given to the church. Paul talks about that in Romans, 1 Corinthians as well. And, and these spiritual gifts are meant to help the, member of the members of the body so that we can be edified. One of them is the gift of healing. When we hear healing, all we think about is healing my broken leg. Or what about your mental and emotional healing that you need? What about that? We've got to elevate that. It's just as important to the family of God as prayer. Who says amen to that today? Now, before I get into the three points, I want to draw a distinction real quick. I want to draw a distinction between feeling depressed and having clinical depression, or what they might call major depressive disorder. Clinical depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent, everybody say persistent, a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. It affects how you feel, think, behave. In fact, we're going to get more into this on this upcoming Wednesday night. We have, we have another health professional that's going to join us this upcoming Wednesday. Uh, Reuben Steele is his name, and he's going to take us through some of these things. We're going to talk specifically a little bit more clinically, because I'm not a clinician. What, what I'm telling you right now is something I looked up and I'm reading. <laughs> I didn't study it, though. But Reuben can help us with this a little bit more. So I invite you to come and join us virtually 7 o'clock on Wednesday night as we do a deeper dive into this idea of depression. But it, it affects... Uh, um, uh, I said it affects your mood, right? Loss of interest. It affects how you feel and how you think and how you behave. It can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. You may have trouble doing normal day-to-day -day activities, and sometimes you may feel as if life is not worth living. So this is more than just a case of the blues. Depression isn't a weakness you can simply snap out of. Depression, this clinical one that I'm describing, sometimes requires long-term treatment, which I believe is a gift of God. But 
don't get discouraged, most people with depression feel better with medication or psychotherapy or a combination of both. So if you're in that predicament, maybe you're someone who wants to just slip a note in my hand at the end of service today and say, Pastor, I need to go further with this. And we have some resources and some people that we can help you with and we can get that ball rolling. But what is a Christian to do? I believe it's okay for us to be depressed. In fact, I think when times are extremely tough, as they have been lately, depression has a higher likelihood that it will set in. But we can be depressed as children of God and yet not be defeated. Now, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me. You are not defeated. Now, you don't understand what I'm saying. You may feel defeated, and I'm not trying to diminish your feelings. I'm not saying your feelings are invalid. What I'm saying is there's a difference between how you feel and what's true. There's a difference between how you feel and reality. You may feel defeated, but if you are a child of God, you are not defeated. You believe that same amen today? <laughs> How do I know? Because Romans 8.31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> and there's many Bible texts just like that that say the exact same thing. And I believe those texts are there so that we can memorize them and bring them to mind and read them to encourage ourselves when we're feeling the exact opposite. Because sometimes we're not going to feel like that's true. But we have to believe that the Bible is true, that God's Word is true, even in the face of how I'm feeling differently. You are not defeated. Okay, so today I want to share three ways that you can be depressed and not defeated. This works for believers, these three things. And the first one is found in Jeremiah 20, verses 10 and 11. So we started our scripture reading earlier in verse 14. We're going to go backwards now to verse 10. Same chapter, same book, but this time we're going to read it in the New Living Translation. Here it is, Jeremiah 20, verses 10 and 11. Listen to the Word of God. I have heard the many rumors about me. This is Jeremiah talking now. They call me the man who lives in terror. They threaten, if you say anything, we'll report it. Even my old friends are watching me, waiting for a fatal slip. He will trap himself, they say. And then we will get our revenge on him. But the Lord stands beside me like a great warrior. Before him, my persecutors will stumble. They cannot defeat me. They will fall and be thoroughly humiliated. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Who says amen to God's word today? <laughs> you had to go backwards to get something encouraging, but it's there in that text. Here is the first way for us to be depressed and not defeated. Here's the first one. You ready for it? Here it is. It harkens back to what we talked about last week, but it's slightly different. Separate your self-worth from your performance. Separate your self-worth from your performance. When you do that, you can start being depressed but not defeated. Repeat after me. My worth is directly linked to my relationship with God. You believe that? Say amen. Let's say it differently. My worth is not linked to what I do, but instead to my relationship with God. You believe that? Say amen. Now, I know right now that is hard for Adventists to say truthfully. I know it because I've been it my whole life. I already know. That was, some of you said it and then lied afterward and said you believe it. It's not even true. You, you want to believe it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not supposed to say you're lying. That's, that was, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. This is, this is a hard truth for us as Adventists. It is. Now, I want us to notice right away that Jeremiah has a reputation, according to this text, that was apparently connected to his performance. And it was so pronounced that the people were spreading rumors about him. You heard him start off by saying, they're spreading rumors about me? The NIV says, I hear many whispering, Jeremiah 20.10. People are threatening him. 
Even his close friends are watching him to see how he will fail. Not, not if he will fail, how. They already know what's going to happen. It seems that everyone is waiting for him to get his just desserts, get what he deserves. It seems that Jeremiah has haters. He does. And this, too, is normal because Jeremiah is a prophet, and very few people like the prophet. The prophet very rarely has good news, especially when the people are in apostasy, as was the case with Judah that Jeremiah was talking to all the time. You see, the time that Jeremiah served as God's prophet was a period of storm and stress when the doom of the entire nation was being sealed. And Jeremiah was called to be the un, to the unhappy task of announcing destruction to the kingdom of Judah, thoroughly corrupted by the long and evil reign of Manasseh. It was Jeremiah's commission to lodge God's indictment against his people and proclaim the end of an era. Not a fun job at all. Especially since Jeremiah made it known that he was naturally timid and thus did not want to be a prophet in the first place. Jeremiah chapter 1, you can go back and read it. So he knows he has a deficiency. Listen to me. And the people around him are talking bad about that same deficiency. He's already self-conscious and now people are adding their commentary about the thing he's self-conscious about. Not an easy place to be. I don't know if you've ever been there, been there before. Have you ever been there before? You ever had to operate from a place where people are talking about you? You ever overhear somebody say something about you that's negative and they didn't know you were listening? How did it make you feel? How did it make you feel, especially when it had a modicum of truth in it? See, if somebody says something about you that you know isn't true, you just let it go off your back like, you know, no big deal. You might get upset, but you know it's not true. But, but, but what, what, if, what if they notice something you're already self-conscious about? And they're whispering about you behind your back. This didn't happen behind my back, but uh, in my family, everybody knows that um, I smack when I eat. This is actually embarrassing for me to tell you right now. You know, normally I don't get embarrassed. Like, I don't, I don't really have a problem telling you stuff. But this one embarrasses me because of what happened, I'll tell you. So everybody knows that I smack when I eat. That means I eat with my mouth open instead of chewing with my mouth closed. You know that. Some of you are disgusted now. You may lose respect for me now. I hope you don't. <laughs> it's such a well-known thing that in my family growing up, my brother used to say, oh, man, that sounds good, John. It sounds like you're enjoying it, you know? Stuff like that. So whenever someone important came to the house to eat for, like, Sabbath dinner and we're all sitting together, I was always conscious that I smack when I eat and I didn't want these people to think ill of me, so I would try my best to chew with my mouth closed. Now, my family would also tell you that part of my problem is that I talk all the time, even when I'm eating. So it's hard to talk with your mouth closed, hence my mouth is open, but I'm eating at the same time, my mouth is open because I'm talking and I'm smacking. You, you get it. So I'm self-conscious about it growing up, and anytime somebody important comes over, I always try my best not to smack. I was out with a group of friends maybe a year ago, and one of my friends made a comment, and I didn't realize he was talking about me. He was talking specifically about the fact that I smack when I eat my food. And another friend responded to his comment with something like, yeah, man, didn't you know? And they're talking back and forth about me in front of me, and I don't know they're talking about me. Until one of them says, another friend chimes in, hey, I just assumed that if we're eating with John, there's going to be some smacking. Then I knew, oh my goodness, these guys are talking about me. I w I've never been that embarrassed in my life. <laughs> you know what made it so embarrassing? It was something I was already self-conscious about. It was true. Now, not everybody cares, but most people do. Most people don't like to eat with somebody who smacks when they eat their food. <laughs> it was a hard truth to hear. Now, I want you to know that after that situation happened, I fought. I'm, I'm being very transparent right now. 
I fought to not let it change my mood. And we were on this trip together. It was supposed to be fun. They were just joking. They actually didn't mean any harm. But it injured me to the point that the rest of the trip I was thinking about it. I'm saying to myself, how long have they been noticing this stuff? Man, how bad have I been smacking? <laughs> Trying to remember all the other times that we ate together. You know what I'm saying? It immediately had an impact. Whenever my performance is being judged, and it's something that I'm already self-conscious about, sometimes it has the effect of changing my mood. And if that happens often enough, that could easily become depression. But what happens when I divorce my worth from my performance? What happens then? Now, what they're saying is maybe negative still, and maybe it still hurts my feelings a little bit, but at the same time, I don't feel like I'm less of a person because of it. You understand what I'm saying? For some of us, it's so tangled up together. Everything's about what we do. Our whole self-worth is wrapped up in our performance, so much so that if we don't perform at peak efficiency every time, it brings us down. We start to think bad about ourselves. We start wondering whether or not we're worth being here at all. I know you've gone through it. You're a human being just like me. <laughs> Everybody has that button that can be pushed. You know, I tend to be pretty tough. You can say pretty much anything to me. It doesn't bother me, unless it's true. <laughs> then all of a sudden, I, I crumble like a leaf. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Now, that was a little funny example. It's kind of a light example, but I think you see what I'm saying. When people say things about us, it has a dramatic impact on how we feel about ourselves, especially when we can detect that it's true. In other words, their negative observation about my performance, when it makes sense, it cuts me down. Sometimes, if we're honest, our inability to live up to others' expectations can get us down too. What we want to be is the one that always does what everybody thinks we're going to do. We want to be able to finish the project. We want to be able to make it up that steep mountain we're all climbing. We want to finish the semester with all A's. It's because in a very real way, our self-worth oftentimes is wrapped up in our performance. By the way, this kind of thing originates in the world, but we perpetuate the same thing in the church. We've made it so that our salvation is about our performance. You don't have to agree with me, that's fine. <laughs> we live in a performance-based society, and it's no different in the church. But it should be. And we believe in our heart of hearts that God loves us more when our performance is good, and that when things are down, He's not as fond of us. That's how we believe. But don't you know that this passage in Jeremiah teaches us the exact opposite thing? Even though all the humans around the prophet are speaking ill of him and wishing negativity on him, the Lord is still with him. And the Bible says he fights for Jeremiah like a mighty warrior, the NIV says. The Lord doesn't listen to the criticism of those around Jeremiah and change his feelings about him based on that. No, he does not. He does not turn his back on Jeremiah because he's not quite as strong or as confident as he should be. No, the Lord of hosts causes Jeremiah's persecutors to stumble so that they will not overcome him. They are greatly shamed and will not succeed. God does not treat us differently when we don't perform perfectly. So we should stop measuring our worth by our performance. Our value is found in the person with whom we are related. And if we really are heirs of the kingdom of God, it means that we are royalty. He's our king and we're in his family. Our worth is immensely more than we could ever measure up to on our own by the things that we do. We can be depressed but not defeated because our worth is not tied to our performance. Our worth is tied to God, and he's so perfect that our worth never changes. Who says amen to that today? 
When the Bible says I am God and I do not change, you know what that means? If he doesn't change and everything I have is based on him, that means everything I have is constant because he's not changing. So I'm still worth what I'm worth, whether I'm doing the perfect thing or, 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 or not doing the perfect thing. It's because God is the one it's based on. Who says amen to that today? Second thing we learn is in Jeremiah 20, verses 12 and 13. So we're keeping on. We, we did 10 and 11. Here's 12 and 13. O Lord of heaven's armies, you test those who are righteous, and you examine the deepest thoughts and secrets. Let me see your vengeance against them, for I have committed my cause to you. Then verse 13, look at it. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord. For though I was poor and needy, he rescued me from my oppressors. Who says amen to God's word today? Another encouraging one right there. The second way for us to be depressed and not defeated, we should start recalling the goodness of God while we're in our dark place. Repeat after me. God is always good, even when my circumstances are bad. You believe that? Say amen today. Goodness of God doesn't change based on my circumstances. He's always good. And I just got to seek and find where he's being good in my life because it's there. I just may not realize it right away. And it's hard to see it when I'm going through a difficult time. But that's the time, according to Jeremiah, to start looking for the hand of God. Notice what he does in the text. He launches right into recalling the goodness of God and giving him praise for it. Notice nothing has really changed yet. The circumstances aren't any different. He doesn't wait until his, his enemies are actually vanquished to start giving God compliments. He's not moved by the change in his situation at all. How could this be? Because he literally, just a few seconds ago, said that people are talking bad about him. That hasn't changed yet. Yet, he finds the ability to think about how God is good. And we can learn something here about the power of our sanctified memory. In fact, Ellen White says this. You know this. It's a famous quote that we quote all the time. We have nothing to fear for the future except we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Sometimes the best thing for you in a circumstance that's negative is for you to remember a time when God bailed you out before. Because <laughs> he did. In fact, she says, we don't have to worry about anything in the future except we forget how God has led us in the past. That's, that's, that's probably the big. If, we forget, if, God, if the devil could get us to forget that, we'd be in trouble. So you keep bringing that stuff to your mind. Start practicing it during your difficult times. Don't wait until it's over. Sometimes remembering what God has done for you can change your mood dramatically. Don't wait until after it's over to recognize the hand of God. Call God's goodness out while you're still going through your negative circumstance. By the way, studies have shown that there is something that happens with your mood when you focus on the positive instead of the negative. So it's not just hocus pocus. There is something to this that studies have shown. This is why we're doing a negativity fast this week. This is why. Sometimes the more negative you are, it ends up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're always going to feel that way because you're constantly dwelling on the negative. Take the time this week to focus on the things that God has done for you. And if you don't think he's doing anything for you right now, think about what he's done for you in the past. <laughs> All right, last one. Third one, last one. Jeremiah recalled God's goodness to him while he was in the dark place, and we should too. Here's the last one. Jeremiah 20 verses 14 through 18. We read it already, but this one I'm going to read now in the New Living Translation. Slightly different. Slightly different because it starts with the word yet. Everybody say yet. Yet. We're going to come back to that. Yet, I curse the day I was born. May no one celebrate the day of my birth. I curse the messenger who told my father, good news, you have a son. Let him be destroyed like the cities of old that the Lord overthrew without mercy. Terrify him all day long with battle shouts because he did not kill me at birth. Oh, that I had died in my mother's womb. 
that her body had been my grave. Why was I ever born? My entire life has been filled with trouble, sorrow, and shame. Here is the third way that we can be depressed but not defeated. You ready for it? Here is the one you're going to be least comfortable with, but this is the one that you're going to find your victory. In fact, when you're really going through it, this is the only one that works to start. You ready? Be radically honest with God about your plight. Did you hear what I said? I didn't just say be honest. I said be radically honest with God. Repeat after me. God can handle my honesty even when I'm upset with Him. You believe that? Now, I want you to look how quickly things change for Jeremiah. Look, we just read several texts in a row. Maybe you didn't realize it because we took it in smaller chunks. Verse 10 and 11, he talks about what his friends and enemies are doing, whispering and gossiping about him. And then he says, but I know that God is here fighting for me like a mighty warrior. Then he goes to the next part and kind of uh, talks about, uh, in fact, it just went out of my head. I had it in my head. I'm going back right now to see what it says. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, uh, sing praise to the Lord, for I was poor and needy. He rescued me from my oppressors. So, so now he's figuring out a way to actually praise God. The very next verse, literally right after the praise, he says, yet, and then switches it up with all of this stuff about not wanting to be born. Not just not wanting to be born, but cursed is my mother's womb and cursed is the guy who came to my dad and said, you have a son. I, I wish my mother's womb was my tomb, is what he said. Well, that, 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 that changed pretty quickly. <laughs> he just finished telling God about his goodness. Then he transitions it with the word yet. Here, the word yet is being used in this context as a conjunction to connect clauses or sentences. So he's using it here sort of as a juxtaposition. I'm praising you, but I'm really still upset about this. Now, let's just pause for a second. Just back up. And uh, is anybody else feeling kind of weird about this? Like, doesn't it feel weird to, like, praise God and then right after that be so radically honest about being upset with God? You would think that right after that would come a rebuke from God. But it's not there. In fact, this is one of the things I love about Scripture. You look at all the famous stories you know in Scripture where people are upset with God, I can't find one time where God says, don't talk to me like that. Think about Job. All that stuff he did, <laughs> you go through the whole book of Job. Now, now, God gets sarcastic with Job and says stuff like, where were you when I did this and that and the other? But that's not the same as rebuking Job for being honest with him. God doesn't do that. He wants us to be radically honest with him. And I'm telling you right now, sometimes your breakthrough comes when you say, God, I can't take this anymore. Where in the world are you? You said you'd be with me. This doesn't feel like you're with me. Where are you? God, God is strong enough to take that. He's the God of the universe. And he wants that. Let me tell you something. He already knows you're thinking it anyway. Saying it out loud is for you, not for him. There's healing in that. And some of us right now, some of us are not crossing that threshold, getting to where we get that completely whole with God, because we're not comfortable enough with Him to be completely honest. Let me tell you something right now. Complete honesty comes from a place of love. It does. So that even when you think the thing you say might hurt the other person, you don't want to keep it from them because you know they need to hear it. I'm talking about our human relationships now. My wife is one of the things she's very good at, and I know my wife loves me. Now, let me tell you this right now. There are people who my wife deals with on uh, maybe a periodic basis. She'll come home and say to me things that she wished she could say to this person about something that they need to hear. And the thing that keeps her from doing it is that they don't have a close enough relationship for her to actually do it successfully. 
She recognizes it, so he doesn't do it. That never happens to me, though. My wife always tells me exactly what she feels I need to hear because she loves me too much to keep that from me. It's the strength of our relationship that allows it to happen. I remember, I think I've told you this before, years ago, there was somebody on uh, Oprah Winfrey's show. It might have been 20 years ago, and she was interviewing these people, and um, this one person was coming on the show talking about how to be a good friend. And she was saying that um, if your friend has on uh, an outfit that is ugly, you shouldn't tell them that it doesn't look good. And she had some other way of, 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 of... kind of skirting around it, she said, you know, um, see if you can find some part of the, of the outfit that looks good and compliment that. Something like that. And Oprah said, uh, I got to disagree. She said, uh, is this person my good friend? The lady said, yes, yeah, your best friend. She said, oh, no, 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 no. If she's my best friend, she better tell me before I embarrass myself in this ugly outfit. If you really love somebody, you're going to tell them because they need to hear it. Now here's what I'm saying to you. God already knows, right? The reality is the reason you're scared to tell him is because you think he'll love you less for what you're going to tell him. But I'm telling you now, I already told you earlier, your worth is not about your performance. God loves you with an everlasting love, no matter how you perform, no matter what you tell him, and he's going to love you even more when you're honest with him. I was a figure of speech. He's not going to love you anymore. He already loves you with an everlasting love. <laughs> you, mean, you, know what I'm, you see what I'm saying? Though. Stop assuming he's going to love you less because you're honest with him. It's going to bring you closer to him. But it's going to happen on your end. You're the one that has the barrier, not him. Jeremiah told God exactly how he was feeling. He pulled no punches. Be honest with God. Tell him exactly how you're feeling, even if you're upset with him. He can take it. So that's it. We can be depressed but not defeated because, number one, we separate our self-worth from our performance. Number two, we recall the goodness of God even while we're still in our dark place. And number three, we are radically honest with God about our plight. I want to do these things, and I I know I don't have the power to do it, so I'm going to raise both hands right now, and I want to invite you to do it too, and just say, I surrender. (laughs) Praise the Lord. So let let me close with this. I I may have told you this before. Please forgive me if I have. Um, You know that I've had cancer. You know I'm a cancer survivor. Most of you know. Maybe some of you don't. Um, I had uh, surgery in 2011, and uh, if you're ever looking at me on this side of my face, you may notice something here. Uh, This is where the surgery scar uh, is. My parotid gland, my left parotid gland was removed. That's where the cancer was. And uh, I've got some darkness here from the radiation burn. And uh, my hair doesn't grow there. If I I were to grow all the hair on my face, it would grow real thick all right here, and nothing would grow on this side. (laughs) It's like dead cells over there now. I'm glad that I was able to go through all of those procedures because obviously it saved my life. And here I, I was 30, 30 years old? Uh, 2011. What, what's, what year is this? 2022, right? <laughs> How many years ago was 2011? That was 11 years ago? Okay, so I, I guess I was 33 because I'm, I'm, I'm 44 now. Yeah, I'm not good at math, y'all. It's my bad. <laughs> I was still a young man in my estimation and found out that I had cancer, had to get this surgery. There was something that happened that I was not expecting. Um, The place I was getting my radiation from, I had to go for seven weeks, maybe eight weeks, something like that, and um, I would go to this place and there was this team of people who would meet with me and get me all ready and stuff like that and change my clothes and, you know, put this, uh, prep the whole machine and I would get into the machine, they would uh, put this thing over my head so that my, my face would not move and then they would uh, run the machine for maybe 20 or 30 seconds. Wouldn't take long. And I remember the first two weeks uh, feeling very strong still. And the doctor warned me that as radiation builds up in your system, it will begin to make you tired, but the first couple of weeks you'll be okay because it's building up in you. So he was right. After a few weeks, I 
sort of had to go take naps afterwards and things like that, um, I started noticing a change in my mood. I wasn't as um, energetic as I would normally be. Y'all, y'all seen me before. Uh, Lizzie always tells me to slow down. I say, Lizzie, I got one speed. I can't slow down. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm always going fast. I, I'm, a, I'm an energetic guy. But, but during this time, my, my, my energy was sapped, you know, physically, because I was tired from getting all this radiation. But it actually correlated with my real mood, too. And I, I noticed I was much more somber than I used to be. And I was really glad when we got toward the end of the radiation because I was wanting to feel like myself again. I was happy because I, I knew that once the radiation was done, I would come back to normal. But another thing the doctor warned me about that I did not really pay attention to when he said it is that because the radiation is built up in your system, it's going to also take a couple of weeks for you to start feeling physically normal again. So on the day you're finished with your radiation, you're not going to be bouncing back. It's going to take you a little while to start getting back. And so he was right. I got home and was more tired than I'd ever been. And then the next day, same thing. But the kicker was this. I set a date to come back to preach again. So this is seven weeks in a row that I took off. I lined up a bunch of different preachers. I was going to church on Sabbath still, but I thought I might not be strong enough to preach. And, and I was right. I was glad that I took that time. And so every week we had a, a really good guest speaker that was coming to church. And I would sit there and get a good word. And then next week we'd have another guest speaker. So I was excited about coming back and preaching on the Sabbath that I had scheduled to be back. This is the eighth week now. Radiation's over. I'm back to normal. Here I'm coming back. Something happened that morning that I was not expecting. And before I tell you that, I want to tell you how the Lord works. At the same time as I was planning to come back, the Holy Spirit was talking to my father. At the time, my dad lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and we lived in Durham, North Carolina. That's where we were pastoring. And so my father and mother said, hey, we want to drive up and come back for your first Sabbath back. I said, okay, that's great. Welcome them. They came that weekend. Little did I know, my father had something else up his sleeve. My dad came to my house with a sermon. I didn't know it. That Sabbath morning, I wake up. I go and I get in the mirror. I brush my teeth. I splash some water on my face, and I look at the side of my face, and for the first time in the entire radiation process, my skin is broken and I'm bleeding. And I don't know what happened. Just in that moment, I saw that. I, I was in the bathroom by myself. I saw that. I got like woozy and lightheaded. I sat down on the toilet, and then April came in, and she said, oh, man, what happened? I said, I don't know. I, I, you see my face? She said, oh, my goodness, you're bleeding. She, she got a, a, a washcloth and she put some water on it and patted it a little bit. And then she got some cold water and put it on the back of my neck. I started to feel a little bit better. And something said to me in that moment, you're coming back too quickly. You're, you're not ready to preach yet. I didn't know what I was going to do. Dad came in from the other room. He said, John, I wasn't sure, but just in case I came with a sermon, I can preach for you today. <laughs> And so they got to hear from the real John Nixon that day. Everybody was happy. <laughs> but I stayed home on that Sabbath, and something happened that I wasn't expecting. It was like the moment I looked at myself in the mirror, something happened to my mood. It was like I was broken, and I wouldn't be fixed for a couple of months. That day marked the day that I began to feel depressed. April said I was like a totally different person. I didn't want to be involved in anything. I didn't want to get out of the bed. I had no motivation at all. I felt so defeated. And by the way, let me tell you how I know right now this performance thing is real. The thing I was really upset about is that I set a date to come back and I couldn't come back on the date that I set. And I thought people would think I was weak. I said I'll be back on that side, but I didn't come back. That was the root of my problem. And it turned into so many other things. Now, the real issue at the time 
was that I was not the way I am now. I did not think highly of therapy, so I never got any. By the way, when I did therapy on my sabbatical for six weeks, guess what subject matter came up? <laughs> A time when I had cancer, and I felt like I was inadequate. Still dealing with it 10 years later. Look, what is this? What did I say? 2022. 11 years later, whatever it is. Still dealing with it. <laughs> Another plug for therapy. What's my point? My point is that entire time, God was with me. But I still felt depressed. If somebody had said to me, God does not love you any less because you're in a depressed mood. I would have been depressed, but not defeated. <laughs> I might have felt defeated, but I would have known I'm not defeated. Sometimes our perception of things actually makes things worse. We think we're helping our family member by saying, oh, you're not over that yet? It's been several weeks. Come on, get out of the bed. Let's go. You think you're being encouraging. You don't realize you may be feeding the very thing that's keeping them depressed. We gotta change the narrative, guys. <laughs> we gotta make it a safe place to be able to talk about it from the pulpit and with each other in church. We gotta be able to say, I was going through this and the Lord helped me with that. He can help you too. Sharing tips with each other. How many of us have been through that? We can share actual tips of things that helped us, but we don't wanna do it because there's so shame around that, around that subject. Got to do better. I'm so glad that I had a loving wife and loving children who didn't change the way they thought about me just because I wasn't my old self. And today, I want to pray for that person who may be going through something like that right now. Just like last week, I'm not going to make you stand or raise your hand or anything like that, but you're watching us online or you're here in the sanctuary now. In fact, I'm going to invite you to bow your head right now. And if you're not in that category, I want you to pray for that person who might be in that category, who is dealing with internal struggles, inner turmoil, depression, anxiety, hyperstress. Let's pray for that person right now. That person might be you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you that you have put things like this in the Word of God to remind us that you don't think any differently of us, that we're not worth less because we don't perform at the highest levels. But you are there with us, and you know exactly how we feel. The Bible tells us that there is nothing that we felt that God hasn't felt as well. And so I thank you for that, oh God. But Lord, I'm asking that you would help that person today, that man, that woman, that boy or girl, who's dealing with depression. They're in despair so much so that they want to take their own life. God, help us to even think differently about this suicide thing. We look down on people who have suicidal thoughts, but we just saw two Sabbaths in a row, prophets wanting them to take, uh, you to take their lives. Change our hearts and minds on this subject, God. Give us compassion. Give us the right things to say and help us to shut up when we don't know what to say. God, there are people in the pew with us, right beside us, who are dealing with things and we don't know because we don't have the ability to articulate that here because there's so much shame around it. Change our hearts and minds on that, God. May we be a source of strength and help to each other. May we be willing to seek out counsel and therapy to fix our brokenness. It won't be fast, it won't be quick, it might take a while, but as long as we bottle it up, we're not going to get any better. Remind us that you see us already. That you love us just the same. Help us to find our completeness and our wholeness in you. So that when you come, you can take us to heaven with you. We know when that day comes, all sin and all products of sin will be gone away. That means depression will be a thing of the past. We'll never worry about it again. Bring that day. Help us to be ready. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So now I want to give us an opportunity as I invite the praise team up. The praise team is going to lead us in our theme song. 
and we're going to stand to our feet. And during that theme song, you have the opportunity to respond to the Word of God uh, by giving. Uh, you can come to my right or to my left, and there are offering plates here in the front. Uh, you can give your offering to the Lord. If you're joining us online, you can go to our website, www.thetpchurch.org give, and there you'll find all the ways that you can give to our ministry. Our ministry is dependent upon you, and we thank you for all of the ways that you have been partnering with us to keep this thing going. We believe the word is going around the world because of your generosity, so thank you for that. Praise team, would you lead us in that song as we stand together? be made of Pastor Nixon for a powerful message and thank you praise team 
for that theme song. Don't you just love that song, church family? You know what else I love? I love that we are tackling issues like stress, burnout, depression, anxiety, grief. These are issues that are relevant to what we're going through now. And we're getting a biblical perspective on how to respond. What a beautiful thing. Last week, we had our very own Maya Thomas. And just a way of a reminder, we are having the revival in the sanctuary on Sabbath. And on Wednesday, it's live, but it's streaming on YouTube. I do send an email reminder on Wednesday morning. So if you're not on our email list, please email me, daniel.xisto at thetpchurch.org. I will add you to the list. You'll get all types of relevant reminders. So on Wednesdays, it is on YouTube and we are fielding questions. We're in full discussion, the four pastors and the special guest mental health professional. We are engaging in really good discussion, rich conversation, and we're also taking your questions. Right there on social, you type in your question, we ask it live. It's a great thing. I hope you're with us. Also on Wednesdays, we have weekly quizzes and prizes. Um, Pleased to announce the first winner of our $40 Whole Foods gift card is Sister Lizzie. Congratulations, Sister Lizzie. Use it well. And this Wednesday, we'll have another winner, other prizes and giveaways. And then we have a grand prize. If you take multiple quizzes and get multiple quizzes correct, you'll be entered into the drawing for our grand prize, which will be a... Can you hear that drum roll? It's going to be a one hour and a half long massage at a spa. Yes. We're talking about de-stressing. We're talking about building up our mental health and massage is definitely a way to achieve that. I hope to see you there. Next and very briefly, there is only one more week to secure your free Thanksgiving basket, um, Thanksgiving food basket and turkey. If you or someone you need is in need of a Thanksgiving basket filled to the brim with food along with a frozen turkey, you need to call our community service center, Adventist Community Service Center of Greater Washington by October 14. The time is ticking on that and I don't have control. We need to have this information by October 14 so we could start to fill these baskets. Please don't miss out this year. Information is in the news bulletin. It's something great that you could recommend to someone who you know could use a little help around the holidays. Please check that out. Also in the newsletter, there are two game nights coming up October 15th. There is apple picking, which has been rescheduled. There is a church basketball league, which Mr. Kevin McRae, we want to see you in. More on Kevin in a little bit. And there's so much more in the newsletter. Uh, It's really the lifeline uh, of how we communicate with the church. So again, you could email me if you're not receiving that newsletter and we will get it to you. Please check it all out. We are still accepting applicants for our paid position for church treasurer. We need your help because our goal was to receive six outstanding candidates from which we could choose from. Right now, we have received two outstanding candidates and we love and are excited about them, but we want to get to the full six and we only have two more weeks to go. So please email me or call the church office by uh, Monday or Tuesday. Let us know that you are interested. Let us know that someone you know. We're looking 